think we're good. Why don't we uh, why don't we <laughs> hop in now? So um, first of all, I want to welcome everybody on board. Uh, thank you for everybody that signed up. Thank you for all our panelists that have come on today. My name's Cameron Wicks. I'm, I'm with Sonero. And like I said, I appreciate you being here. Uh, we're going to talk about people, places, and collaboration and how to adjust to a new way of working with everything that's been going on. Um, we're going to talk about the new working environment, uh, impacts on workplace design, uh, technology, and culture as well. Um, I want to start by just going around with our panelists and allowing them to introduce themselves. Uh, and we'll start with uh, Nick. Hello, everyone. My name is Nick Kaselniak, and I'm the Director of Marketing and Strategic Communications at BHS. BHS is a provider of comprehensive well being solutions for organizations specializing in employee, member, and student assistance programs crisis management support, behavioral risk mitigation strategy and consultation, as well as organizational development and training solutions. In my role, I help organizations with their communications and marketing strategies to improve engagement and optimize performance. And I'm really grateful to be here today with these incredible industry experts. And, and I really look forward to sharing some insights with you over the next 45 minutes or so. Thank you, Nick. Why don't we go to Rob? Great, thanks, Cameron. Uh, my name is Rob Gilfillan. I'm a president and a co-owner of a company named Scenario. We're a service-focused audiovisual conferencing solution provider uh, committed to designing and and uh, delivering uh, extraordinary meeting spaces, uh, primarily around AV uh, conferencing um, uh, type experiences. Uh, I've been in the industry for uh, 25 years. Um, I've <laughs> seen everything from max headroom to uh, you know to uh, virtual whatever's coming down the pike next. So I'm, I'm happy to share a lot of that experience with you all today. Thanks, Lauren. Hi, I'm Lauren Coglin with um, D2 Groups, and I'm director of strategy and culture. Um, D2 Groups we're a full service design firm, so we started out um, a little under 20 years ago um, as an interior design studio. We quickly grew and matured our architecture group. And um, we've since added engineering and um, MEP engineering. And our newest group is Brand Identity, which has been you know, a really wonderful um, addition to our studio. And you know, they really help us design what we always call branded environments, which is really designing holistically. And it's about taking a, an organization's brand, character, culture, personality, and weaving that through the design of the space um, through experience. So storytelling essentially is what we like to say we do. And Kimberly. I love it. And I always love your stories, Lauren. So you're good at the branded environments. I'm Kimberly Smith. I'm representing Knoll. We are an office furniture manufacturer, but really a constellation of design driven brands uh, that help people create amazing holistic workplaces. So we'll talk a little bit about that today. And I'm thrilled to be here with the audience. Uh, and just a quick note before we jump in for the people in the audience, if you have a question, please uh, use the chat function. I'll be monitoring the chat. Uh, and I'll take a look and I'll, I'll put your questions in here as they come in. So uh, why don't we jump right in then? We're going to start by talking about workplace design and space and tech considerations for the new office environment. And we'll start with Rob. Uh, Rob, how do you think the changing way that people are working is going to influence how they connect and how they collaborate? Sure. Uh, well, one thing that um, in the 25 years that I've been in this industry, uh, the one thing that's consistent, that's even consistent today is with video and collaboration, it's not a if you build it, they will come type of type of solution. So just to give you an example, um, uh, phones, printers, copiers, everyone understands the, the inherent value of those things in the workplace. So you're going to use a phone to pick up, make a call, check voicemail, things like that. Everyone knows what a printer and copier does. The video has always been kind of one of those things. It's a little it's a little different. Um, just because you have video doesn't mean that people understand not how to use it, but why they should use it. So um, we really try to, I mean, even pre-COVID, we really try to get um, our clients to focus on outcomes and success criteria. So what are the use cases and the business applications that are actually going to um, get the most out of your investment? The thing that's changed really over the past several weeks is um, prior, the lug it was a luxury to have video because, hey, you're going to save time and money, and, and that's all great. And there were some uh, people uh, focused on specific use cases to their, that's, that's uh, inherent to their, to their job. For example, like I'm an HR director, or I can do remote interviews, or I can do a virtual benefits rollout to my entire organization. Like that, 
that's a defined use case in the business application as opposed to driving all over the place. What's changed is now the, the, the need to, uh, to, to meet remotely is, is mandated. So you're, everyone's kind of forced into this mandate. And by the way, here are some tools kind of figured out. Right. So, um, so there, there really, while there wasn't a goal and objective along the way, there was the need to do things remotely. And a lot of people just kind of floundered the way to try to figure out how to use teams or, or zoom or whatever. Um, but, uh, but the one thing that's kind of held true is, you know, we have to be focused on what is going to define this being successful. And it's really making sure that we're up to speed on the inner integrated collaborative tools, Ultimately, it's all about an experience. So we want to make sure that our experience that we have similar th here is very similar sitting across the table from, from, uh, from either a cohort, an employee, a partner, whatever. But the more seamless you can make that, the better. And what we've all seen is when we all started to have these meetings over Zoom, everyone was using their, their laptop and the integrated microphone and the speakers. And I don't know if anyone on this call would say that that was a great experience by any means. So we've slowly integrated things to try to improve that USB headsets, larger monitors, I mean, things of that sort. So um, I mean, we, we, still, we still see these, these improvements to try to make both the at-home experience as well as the experience at the office that much better. And what we're gonna find as we go back on the workplace is we're, we've all been used to doing this thing remotely on our computers, but bringing the conference room back in is, is a whole different ball game. We're already starting to see people going back and they haven't prepared for bringing the conference room back in. And it's not only a, a how to facilitate the meeting logistics, but also the technologies don't mesh, they don't integrate, and it's a fragmented, um, poor experience. We've been talking a little bit with our customers about that as well, Rob, and we are calling it a fidgetal experience, the physical yeah, and the digital. <laughs> I'm sure it's made up word, but I think it's interesting. But it means that you know you're physically in the space and digitally in place. So you have to blend those two together. And I keep saying people are sitting behind one singular screen and camera like you were describing. And once we do translate that into a conference room, you're gonna need cameras, speakers, et cetera. So it's gonna be a whole new ball game. Agreed. And, and Kimberly, kind of playing off that then, how do you think, in a larger sense, how do you think that it's the new model is going to look, right? Are most people going to keep working remotely? Are they going to come in? Is it going to be this digital experience, as you call it? What, what, what do you think that that's going to look like down the road? Uh, certainly. Um, I think because we've proved in this um, experiment of remote work that everyone has figured out a way of making it happen, um, that people are going to want ultimate flexibility of deciding where they're spending their time and what they're going to the office for. So perhaps they'll have a balance and a flexible, you know, thinking about flexibility in the work schedule is going to be an important thing for employers to um, empower their employees to really make that decision so that they can really decide, you know, the times when you do need to meet with your team and be together and maybe do some sort of creative brainstorming. And then sometimes the heads down work could be accomplished better uh, at home or remote work wherever you're spending your time. So we're seeing a combination. Okay. And, and Lauren, how do you think that's going to impact how offices are set up. I mean, what, what, you know, how is what are the offices going to look like uh, from a, a, a design perspective? Yeah, I think um, I, well, I agree with you know everything Kimberly just said, and I think in order to answer your question, I'll pose one because I think that will help us kind of resolve maybe how the office will be set up. And that question is when one can work anywhere, when a team can work anywhere. What will make me walk out my front door and go into the office? Because that ultimate flexibility that Kim's mentioning, you know, if we have that choice, then we need something to be pulling us there. So I think what we need to evaluate is what did we gain by working from home on an individual level? And then what did we maybe lose and see how the workplace can match that gain and, you know, pick up that loss. So um, I think ultimately what we've gained is a super flexible environment, um, an ownership of our days um, and our hours, and um, really greatly increased flexibility and ability to focus. I think even those of us who are home with kids right now, um, 
myself included. My husband is a essential worker, so it's me and my two girls. And I still find more time to focus at home than I did when I was in the office five days a week, which is pretty amazing, but true. Um, so I think that's what we've gained. And then what we've lost, uh, we've lost, you know, a good deal of things, but I think ultimately what it comes down to is that energy of room. It's, you know, it's being together in one place. There are so many advantages of being together in terms of quick decision making, um, you know, innovation, um, mentorship, that kind of thing that just really is challenging for a lot of us to do virtually. And, you know, I listened into another webinar a couple days ago or a couple weeks ago, and it was about presenting virtually. And there was a really, really interesting st statistic in that webinar. Um, that was percentages of interest. What makes you an interesting presenter or an interesting collaborator in you know, a team setting? And there was a pie chart. I don't remember the full breakdown of percentages, but when you go virtual, you immediately lose 50% of your interest. So think about that 50% gone. It's pretty incredible. Um, so you can imagine you know, those little you know, body language nuances that we get from each other when we're bopping images around, being able to read each other um, and feed off that energy is a big loss. So, with that said, I think that the workplace will be a place where we go to come together. If I'm going to get in the car and drive for 45 minutes or hop on the subway, I'm doing that to be with my team, not to go sit alone. Um, so there'll be a much less emphasis on individual workspaces and a much greater um, meeting space, collaborative space, innovation space. Um, and you know, just a couple additional things that I think maybe will shift is um, an increase in adaptability and flexibility. Um, you know, we've seen some of our clients who really embraced kind of this agile environment, and that could be, um, you know, unassigned seats or, you know, having a diverse environment where you can kind of move around. Um, or it could just be that it's flexible in terms of furniture arrangement and there's power sources and the space can be reorganized. Our clients who have spaces like that will have a much easier time coming back to the workplace than those that are a little more structured, a little more permanent, um, because they'll have to make greater infrastructure changes to address safety requirements and that kind of thing so that it doesn't feel too temporary. Um, so I think moving forward, we might see a greater um, embracing of a flexible environment um, at, in future planning. So um, one other thing that I wanted to mention too is culture. And although this isn't necessarily how an office is set up, um, I think it will drive how we approach space. Um, because what we're hearing is, we're getting a lot of questions about, you know, it's not will my culture change, it's how will my culture change? How will I get ahead of this change? And how can I use my workplace as a tool to build the culture in a positive way. We know it's going, we know a distributed workforce will change culture. So, you know, how can that layout of the space, how can the components of it really make it a positive shift? Well, I think too, creating equity amongst the digital experience, you know, people that are physically that in place or there. Um, and I'll just add really quickly to what Lauren had to say about um, people in our research group, which I'm workplace strategist in the research group. Um, we did a study and uh, interviewed people to say, what is it you miss about your workplace? And 90% of people said they miss people. So one of the topics of our discussion today is people, 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 that's what they missed. We kept hearing it from everyone, not a single person practically didn't say that. And they missed their collaborative workplace, meaning their ergonomic tools, their accessories, their lighting, their great chair, those sorts of things they missed. Um, and the reason they were missing all that is because they do feel like they're missing the community, the culture, the connection to the organization. So you could work from anywhere, and, or I should say, you could work for anyone in this digital experience. What's going to be the part that's going to connect you to your employer as an engaged employee? And um, the reason why, to your point, Lauren, of driving 45 minutes uh, to get to a space, you're gonna go there to be with people. So who knows what the percentage is going to be. I think occupancy sensors are also gonna be added in more often so people get a, can get a sense of their um, big picture uh, corporate real estate portfolio packages, so. And Kimberly, to kind of build off what you were saying, our company holds a monthly meeting where we celebrate success. And that meeting is, particularly since we've started this shift to, to remote work, has been well attended, more well attended than when we were actually in the office. And, and it is because people are missing that connection. So having the technology in place and 
being able to see everybody's face on a video screen and asking how they're doing has just been tremendous for our organization. And, you know, it's great that we're all coming together and celebrating success because we really need that at this time right now when there's a lot of uncertainty and going on. So, you know, using the technology available and, and bringing your teams together and, and celebrating your organization's success is a great way to, to promote a positive work environment. Yeah, and, and Nick, kind of to, to play off them, what are some other ways to maintain culture, maintain con uh, connections when you're considering a fragmented workforce, right? I think this has been a, a, a concern for some companies for a long time when it, with the advent of work from home is the ability of how, how do you bring those people into the fold? And now you have to, right? That there has to be a way to, to do that at this point. So what's a way to do that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it starts with understanding that everyone's experience through this whole uh, situation has been very different. There's some employees who are isolating alone while others are taking care of their kids or elderly parents. Um, you'll also find that, you know, some employees are just really eager to get back to the workplace. They thrive being around folks and they need that, that human to human connection. But then you're going to have others who are really enjoying being at home and, and seeing their kids uh, full time. And then there's just others who are, are really just afraid to be around others right now. There's still a lot of uncertainty with the way that this uh, pandemic is, is playing out. But, you know, with a fragmented workforce, the, the biggest thing that you can do is connect with your employees regularly. And there's many practical ways that organizations can, can, stay, can stay connected with their folks and, and really maintain a culture. You know, I think one of the, the, the big things that we've found have been successful with many organizations is just scheduling a regular mental health check-in so employees can come together and openly discuss the challenges that they're facing and offer coping tips to one another. And this can be done at an organizational level, but I think for it to be really effective, it's, it's done more at the, the department level. Um, you know, these, these check-ins are really comforting for, for the folks who attend, and it really helps them understand that they're not going through the, the situation alone. So it's, you know, it's with these check-ins, it's really important to, to keep them regularly scheduled, and you want to make sure that people know when and where and how to show up to them. You know, on a, and on a less formal level, you know, organizations and, and specific departments can also host virtual happy hours to, to bring their teams closer together. And we found that it's been, you know, fun and exciting to incorporate team building and morale activities um, such as scavenger hunts. So there, there's a lot of different ways that you can bring people together and, and you know, maintain that culture. And, and lastly, I think for, for managers and supervisors, it's critical that they reach out to their team members on a regular basis. And, and you know, that can go with scheduling weekly one-on-ones with their team or bi-weekly one-on-ones. And during these sessions, you know, managers should really listen here and acknowledge their employee, um, you know, what they're going through without agreeing or disagreeing with his or her opinion. And what that really does, it shows them that they really care about their personal well-being. And again, it really ensures a, a positive workplace culture. Mm -hmm. I think there's such a complexity to this, Nick. Um, having you here is really an important part of the health aspect of it and just the mental well-being of employees because mm -hmm. it's really difficult. No one's dealt with a pandemic before and there's so much complexity of having your kids and working from home and there's no school and there's no daycare and all of those sorts of things. So I think that that's really been a challenge for people and much longer than people expected. It Early in March when we started sort of hearing the rumblings that mid-March mm -hmm. were going to be, you know, shelter in place and stay at home orders. I think that people didn't expect that the virus would be lingering and people would be fearful of it for all of that time. So I'm just curious at BHS what you guys have been doing in the way of setting up programs for the companies that you uh, have as clients. No, and that's a great question. You know, one of the things that we have done, and, and a lot of our, our sessions are done virtually, but you know, we have programs for, for managers and supervisors to help them gauge the mental health and well-being of their folks, you know, through these regular check-ins. Um, and we'll, I'll kind of go through a little bit later on some of the signs to look for, you know, when, when it comes to judging the, the mental health and well-being of your directs. But, you know, it's really, for us, it's being a workplace consultant and a workplace performance partner. You know, we want to make sure that the organization is set up and, and truly understands that we can't rush people back to the work environment because there some people feel really unsafe right now and, you know, don't want to come back to the work environment. They feel much safer in their homes. 
Yeah. And if we put them in an environment where they're uncomfortable, they're not going to be productive at all. Mm -hmm. So we need to consider their emotional well-being on top of their physical health and, and, and safety. And if we rush people back to the work environment before it's, it's really been deemed safe, then, you know, we can run into those situations where we're just, our, our workforce isn't productive. So we're there to consult with organizations, find out when it's right for them to bring people back to the workplace, but also put in programs in place for, for managers and supervisors to, to keep the morale, to keep productivity up and to regularly check in with their employees. Awesome. Interesting. Um, and, and Kimberly, what are your thoughts on encouraging connections between people who are in an office and those working remotely? And I'd, I'd kind of like to hear from, uh, you know, we heard from Ick on that front, but Kimberly, I'd like to hear from you, hear from Rob about that point and, and Lauren as well. Yeah, so our research team early in the pandemic, we were actually approached probably the second week, um, quite honestly, it definitely was still March, by one of our big financial customers in New York. And he is a facilities planner and he was freaking out that, you know, how am I going to get people back to a healthy workplace? How am I getting people back? So we assembled um, panel discussions, peer to peer panel discussions that were all done virtually, obviously, right now. Uh, but we've had over, you know, 225 people participating in these roundtable discussions just to get a sense on what is going on. And, you know, with social distancing, people can't logistically get everyone back into a very dense floor plan in many cities. So that's been a challenge that they are 100% going to have this hybrid of people both um, in place and, and working from home. Um, so it really requires a lot of communication, a lot of scheduling in order for people to understand, you know, which groups need to be together. So we've seen and heard lots of um, surveying of their employees and really like almost a change readiness survey uh, of readiness to come back to the workplace because that's really what people and everyone's situation is so different and complex you could have an elderly relative that's living with you and you 100 percent feel like remote work has to be your future your your short-term future so i think that that's you know everyone needs to be checked in on as nick mentioned because they have different things different arrangements they won't have school they won't have daycare so again those people might have to choose the remote even though they 100 percent might be in the category of as i say turning cartwheels to get back to the office because a lot of working parents are really really struggling with the whole balance because it's tough to tell a toddler that you're sitting there physically in your house but you're working it's hard to sort of turn that clock off in a toddler's mind so that's really been something that we've been hearing from people. So I do think that technology is going to have to be reconsidered in meeting spaces in the physical workplace uh, so digital people can dial in seamlessly. So I believe that's really kind of what's next. I also think we have to deal with acoustics. This is like a whole other topic of conversation, but we have to deal with the acoustics because people are going to go back. It's going to be, you know, half capacity per se while we're in this phased reentry plan. And at that half capacity, the sound of the space is going to be different. There's going to, it's going to be quieter. And is that quiet, you know, depressing? Is it reminding you that this virus is out there? So there's all these sort of like, moments that need to be considered in getting people back to a healthy workplace. So our group published a bunch of pieces that's on our NOL.com research tab website to really share and help people with checklists of what to consider when sending um, people back or getting the facility ready for their people to get back. One thing, uh, one thing that's interesting about, about um, being in our position is we're kind of the aggregator for the, um, the culture challenges technology challenges, the workplace challenges, and then we're, we're looked at as the, the tech folks are supposed to fix all this stuff, right? Okay, how do I get people talking, right? How, what do we do here? And the, the, I think that one of the, what, what I end up doing whenever, whenever I'm presented with a challenge such as, okay, we got all these people remotely, um, we figured out the virtual happy hour, okay, that's gotten old, and no more Zoom happy hours. What do we do outside that? And um, <laughs> So we have a we have someone that um, we have a, a director of training. We've done some gamification um, for some different folks to help uh, help train them on doing some things differently uh, with video. Um, but we we're always we're also trying to look at the or trying to consider the the technical um, what's possibly technically. So Zoom is not the end all be all. Teams is not the end all be all. 
Cisco WebEx, they're not the end all be all. You, you kind of have to look at, again, the, the type of application such as, I want to have a company wide meeting. Okay, that's great. Can we use Zoom for that? Well, I'm not sure. Do you want breakout sessions in that meeting? Um, do you want to have a facilitator in that meeting? Is it going to be PowerPoint or is it something else? Do you need, do you need to transmit audio um, through, uh, through the meeting from an application? I mean, there, um, we, want, I, we had one client wanted to set up a virtual, a virtual water cooler in all their offices. So when they come back, just like going to water cooler, they literally have a monitor that has all their offices there that people can go and walk up to and have a discussion. So when they come back, it's, it's promoting more of that call it casual interaction in the office. You know, they, they think that's because they're not going to have as many people in the office. So they want people in the other offices to have casual interaction with other offices, you know, so, yeah. so that, you know, how do you, how do you use technology as, to solve some as of casual as dialing into a um, video platform is right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, this would be up all the time. Right. So yeah, one thing, oh, one interesting. Yeah. yeah. One client brought, one client brought something up with kind of underlaid. He said, they said, uh, I wonder if, I wonder if starting to drink at three o'clock in the afternoon is going to be accepted in the office. Um, once everyone goes back. <laughs> <laughs> it has been at home for many people know. and could, every day of the week, right? I mean, it could, could yep. be a new cultural norm. So yep. I keep hearing from people, which is making me laugh, is that they feel like every day is Tuesday, <laughs> right? And like every day is Tuesday. <laughs> you got past Monday, but every day feels so, you know, like sort of the redundancy of this has really become difficult for people to deal with. Right yeah. Lauren, did you want to jump in on anything uh, regarding uh, how to bridge people before we jump to the the next uh, the next topic here? Yeah, and I think it kind of might roll into the next a little bit, but um, you know, Kim mentioned um, panels and um, surveys, and I think that's a really wonderful way to kind of gather information. Um, one of the other things that we've been talking about is just kind of a little bit more of like a top down decision maker communication because. Um, there's definitely a reluctancy to communicate information that feels half-baked. I mean, traditionally in business, we want to formalize it, we type it up, we put it in the file, we send it out, we don't want anybody, any confusion, no questions asked. But I think, you know, all along this, you know, journey we've been on, leaders should really have been communicating excessively. Um, but as we move forward and we're getting closer to moving back into the office, so we think um, that that communication really needs to ramp up. Um, you know, maybe it's weekly and it's okay to say, you know what, we don't really know. This is what we think. This is where we are. Just checking in. Happy Friday, whatever. You know, it doesn't necessarily need to be formal. And I think that will help people feel um, like their employers have their best interest in mind and that they're going back to a safe environment, which I think, you know, was maybe um, one of the future questions that I'm kind of <laughs> skipping around here. But um, just that you know we can do make all the protocol changes we can put all the safety measures in place but if it's not communicated and overly communicated and done so in a way that makes us feel comfort yeah. with going back to the office it it still will be a scary environment and it won't be comfortable so i i love that you said that because i keep saying to people we're creatures of habit when we go back to our work environment we're going to fall back into old habits and that old habit so might not be an acceptable path of travel because there might be one way directional arrows going the opposite way. So there's a big part of change and communicating that's really um, important. I went to our Philadelphia showroom last week for a meeting and it was so funny because I felt myself, like I've been telling people, but the actual physical, like walking into the space, I did what I always do. I walked to go get a cup of coffee <laughs> and then realized that there was a one way directional path. I'm like, this is exactly what I've been talking about. Now I'm physically living it for, you know, a little test meeting. So it's just interesting to see, but etiquette, um, we actually updated our etiquette guide because before the pandemic, our number one downloaded piece of research was open office etiquette and people wanted to sort of get a sense of what, you know, how to tell people the expected behaviors in a space. So we modified that to include the um, considerations for returning to a healthy workplace and an etiquette guide to help. And that's, that's a good question too, right? The, the health, right? There's, we're certainly worried about people's health and safety. We, I think we all agree there's probably going to be new regulations, whether that's on a state level or a local level that are going to be put into place. But, you know, what are companies going to be able to do to ensure the health and safety of the employees? You know, and is there some outside the box approaches? Um, you know, Lauren, you even talked a little while ago about, 
still having collaborative space, right? How are we going to approach something like that and make sure that that is a, a healthy space and it's cleaned up and, and all the things that go along with that? Yeah, um, I mean, there's, you know, we're, we're working with um, so many of our clients right now doing back to the office plans for them and evaluating their spaces and um, proposing approaches and they've all kind of thought through things on, at varying levels. Um, but generally what we're seeing, it's all kind of um, a, a similar approach, I could say. Um, you know, we need to make sure that like Kimberly just mentioned, it's that one directional traffic potentially. Um, a lot of our clients aren't using their lunchrooms or cafe, it's pack your own, put it in a thermos with a nice pack because refrigerators are off limits. It's, you know, strange things that are going to need to be in place. Um, at least in the immediate. And then you know, there's definitely a lot of conversation about shifts, um, bringing people back on, you know, there's team A, there's team B, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, whatever the days are, um, or waves, you know, these are conversations we've been having for some time. Um, I think, you know, once, those are the elements that make the workplace safe. Once we get beyond what makes the workplace safe, then we can start thinking a little bit more out, out, outside of the box, you know, and how we can reevaluate the purpose of the workplace. Um, but for now, to ensure safety, we really just need to make sure that it's clean. Um, you know, we're able to keep our distance. We're not overly sharing, um, overly touching, and that kind of thing. And some people, I mean, as Lauren mentioned, the six-foot distance, um, or if they can't achieve the six-foot distance as well between people horizontal, horizontally, they're thinking vertically. So people are building up, right? They're putting screens that are sort of encapsulating people. And then mentioning, you know, bringing your own lunch, no coffee service, all of these things are sort of lacking hospitality oh, yeah. that our spaces had before. So there's really this moment of like it feeling cold and not feeling warm and inviting, which was what we've worked for years to create in these environments. So there's going to be a moment. Um, and then to your point, Lauren, of like a future, because we're always asked, what's the office of the future? And I feel like you know, we always say there's no one single office of the future. There's only change. So, you know, design is inherently about change. And we know that it's like figuring out the problems yet to come. And we want to always sort of be curious about that. But I think the lacking the hospitality and feeling cold is going to make people want to stay home. So that's really a balance and something that a lot of our customers are really grappling with. You know, how do we safely still serve coffee? How do we safely still do this? So it's been such a crazy time of discussion after discussion and figuring out the right math for every customer. That's been important. Mm -hmm. And even going back, because there have been times where I've gone back to the office for, you know, a small group meeting here and there, but and I'm looking forward to it. And then I get in the room and we all have our masks on. And it's such an uncomfortable experience to communicate that way in person. It's almost more comfortable at this point to do this and actually be able to see each other's faces. So yeah, it's temporarily, it will be a, a challenge. And Nick, we talked about, uh, you know, we're talking about all these changes in regards to health. And, and Kimberly, I thought it was really smart what you said about these places were built to be warm. They were built for hospitality, right? They were built to make people want to be there. And, and that's going to change. Nick, how is that all of that going to affect company culture in terms of the, the workspace changing, the, the health regulations and, and rules around that? What's that going to do? Sure. And, and it's certainly going to have an effect on, on workplace culture. There, there's no doubt about that. You know, with the, the new social distancing regulations and organizations that decide to bring uh, employees back into the office environment. So we mentioned before that they're going to have to be flexible and really clearly communicate, um, even if they don't have all the answers at the time, just overly communicating is, is not a bad thing at, at this time. So you know, many organizations, you know, with, with these different things in place, um, you know, the, the one way directions, um, you know, not anybody in the break room, you know, only one or two people in there. You're going to find people who have differing views on, on the safety precautions that are necessarily necessary in the, in the workplace and clearly communicating and helping your employees understand the whys behind these regulations or workplace policies are really going to help them make them feel more secure in the workplace. And to really, to go even further, you know, organizations are gonna need to provide education and training to employees on these new practices, uh, the new equipment and new procedures, and to help the, the employees and also their customers feel safe both physically and emotionally. And so, you know, as I mentioned before, everyone's pandemic experience is gonna be different. And to really make, to maintain a, a positive workplace culture, 
It's gonna be imperative for organizations to stress the need for employees to be respectful of others, their personal situations, their emotions of feelings related to the pandemic, and the other things that are going on right now. So, you know, one way that organizational leaders can ensure that the best possible reentry results are achieved is to really leverage the knowledge, the resources and relationships that you have, you know, from a top tier employee assistance programs. You know, leaders can look at them and work with the EAP to learn what signs to look for, how to make referrals to the program if people are struggling with mental or behavioral health issues. And really, I, the, the last thing I wanted to say about this is, is the thing that we really need to remember is that a crisis, th this is a crisis that families, neighbors, communities, and yes, even workplaces are, are going through together. And if the workplace is doing the right thing, going through a crisis like this, is going to be an opportunity to gain work cohesion and become a stronger unit. Yeah, I think I think that's definitely true, Nick. And it's, it's pretty interesting. What I've heard is obviously we've been in a terrible situation, but for a lot of people, they've, like you said, they've become stronger. They've become closer to family, closer to friends. Uh, even working from home for some people has been a has been a good thing. So, um, you know, maybe there are some some positive things that in the long run come out of all this for sure. Um, Rob, what kind of technology is going to be helpful in the new office environment, right? So um, if there are things regarding who can come in or shift work or health regulations, things like that, and we can only have a certain amount of people in at a given time or, or whatever it is, what's the technology that's out there that's really going to help drive uh, everything going forward? So um, like I was discussing before, you really want to focus on the why and the outcomes, right? So if you look at the, the and we've all been talking about the business challenges. So you kind of clip away the business challenges kind of one by one, you know, we're talking about culture and communication, right? That's one that I think we've been talking about a lot. So um, if you look at what we've done traditionally for, for organizations uh, uh, like digital signage and communication type solutions within space is something that is, is become a norm over the past 10 years. Um, that's great when you're in this space. What about for people that are not in the space now? So um, there hasn't been a ton of consideration in the past with people that have been working remotely, but today um, there are a variety of solutions that will take you know, your inner office communications and extend them through an application within Microsoft Teams, say. I mean, there are a ton of different ways you can do that. So you gotta think about how to have consistent messaging from a variety of locations. Um, I mentioned the virtual water cooler is something that we've talked to several of our clients about and they find that resonates with them and they're looking to, to design and put those into the, into the various spaces. So that's one. Um, obviously, uh, uh, health and wellness, and we've all gone into office spaces, and one of the standards now is they're gonna take your temperature on the way in, right? So um, uh, there are a variety of solutions around that, depending on what type of organization you are and how many employees you have. Um, there are scanners that you can walk in, walk the lobby, literally look at it, it'll take your temperature, it'll record it, and you walk in, it'll give you a green or red, and it'll, it'll record that. Um, uh, cameras today actually have integrated heat sensors in them. So if you can have a climate controlled lobby and you have a number of people walking into the lobby, the camera can sense different, different people as they're walking in and actually take multiple temperatures of the people coming in and record them as they're walking through. You can actually integrate with facial recognition as well. So you know who's coming in, what their temperature is for the day, and make sure that gets recorded. And, and companies are very concerned with that type of data as well. Today. It's a little big brother, but um, there's not one large Fortune 1000 company that we're talking to that isn't considering solutions around that. Um, being able to um, you know, have recognition, take your temperature, and actually have a kiosk below to, to walk you through putting on sanitizer before you walk into a space. And we, we're seeing a lot of those types of solutions, and we're talking to clients about that. Um, touch list is something that obviously is, is on everyone's mind. Um, even before this, uh, one of the things in our industry that's really been driven is, is how do you have, um, and, and traditionally these integrated conference spaces, the, the ones that we see get over-designed a lot of times, they're very complicated, they have a lot of buttons, it's just too much. So how do you, how do you design a solution where it's interface less, that I don't have to interface with it at all? So, um, so that's getting taken to another level, such as contactless. And I know, Tim, you mentioned occupancy sensors. Um, we've been working with occupancy sensors for years, and, we're, and there are more and more use cases with it in our industry. Everything from 
triple divisible rooms where you have sensors around the wall. So the room is set up depending on how you decide to set the room up. So the, we understand how the meeting is going to function based on the way the room's set up as opposed to starting with hitting a bunch of buttons to set the room up. It's going to be set up because of the way the walls are set up. It, it already knows the way the room's going to be set up. As you walk into a conference room, it senses you're coming in. It'll turn the system on. As you plug in your laptop, it'll go to the input and you can run the meeting. When you unplug it and leave, it'll it'll shut the system down. So um, there are a ton of things you can do that you don't have to really touch anything. You don't have to tell anything to do anything. It'll just happen. Um, and the last piece is we already have these personal devices um, you know, that we take everywhere. And um, so is having an application that as you walk into a space, it senses that you're there based on based on Bluetooth and you can actually operate the system for the solution in the room on your personal device that you're already comfortable with. So you're not interfacing with anything else. It's actually, you already have it. So these, these, um, these on top of just improving that experience in the conference room through improved audio, they have cameras that will auto frame and travel around with you and are much more intelligent than they were even a year ago. Um, where it's it's not the awkward camera angle that nobody changes. It's focused on someone's nose in the conference space. I mean, I sat through a meeting weeks ago that was like, that was amazing. But it actually is smart enough to know and it'll travel around the room and frame in the different people that are talking. So, and those are just some of them. Um, and the last piece is companies, the trend is more has been more meeting spaces. We do believe when people start going back into the office, they're gonna be investing more into these collaborative spaces, not less. Um, we already see that with a number of our clients that are preparing for that. Um, so you have more spaces and what has been traditionally lacking with organizations is the data about what spaces are being used, how they're using it, what's working, what's not working, and being able to look at this data and try to figure a way to have an improved outcome next time around. I think, I, I think all of you would agree the majority of the time you walk into a conference room, it doesn't work. I mean, it's, it's fumbling around for a moat some cable is in there. So what happens in these larger organizations is this whole subpar meeting culture becomes rather prevalent, but nobody can ever get the root cause and fix it. So Orin just accepts it, knows that, you know, Nick down the hall knows where the magic remote is that he can change the input to get the meeting going, you know, so. I mean, he must be the IT guy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, these are all things that we're, we're seeing. Um, I mean, they've always been important, but we're seeing them be more important you know, as of late. All right, thank you, Rob. And I actually, I have an audience question I want to go to real quick. And just a reminder, feel free to submit questions uh, through the chat. Uh, in this case, it actually came in through the Q&A portal. So um, how, do you, how do multi-tenant facilities manage and maintain workspaces with diff, uh, such different needs? Uh, the example they gave is a facility that has a fitness center with a day spa, a rehab office, and a meeting and event business. Mm -hmm. I'm happy to answer it. Sure. Yeah, okay. There's a couple ways to go. You go, you go first. We've been talking to lots of people who have multi-tenanted spaces and they're concerned about, well, I would say the space types that the, the person asked about weren't the ones that are really um, in question yet until people really start to further occupy buildings. It's really been more about vertical transportation, so elevators, right? People have been very concerned about how to um, efficiently get a lot of people into a space in not knowing the plans of the other tenants within this space. So um, I would say for those space types that were asked, those would probably have to be for the, you know, the short term near future um, occupancy, you know, maximum occupant occupancy in those space types and masks need to be required. You know, lots of people have a program where it's masks in motion anytime you're moving. Like if you're at your workspace and you're standing there, or if you're at a gym and you're on a piece of equipment, but you're distanced from someone, you have a mask when you're moving from that environment. So if you're in a set place, you're okay to work out because it's hard to breathe with one. So I've seen people sort of dealing with it in many different fashions. But like Lauren mentioned, you really have to look at every single client floor plan, every building about the spaces that they're going to be utilizing and make decisions based on that. Yeah, and I think, you know, as a whole, probably for any building that's multi-tenanted, um, the building landlord or building manager has to evaluate 
the common spaces before the tenants can really make their own evaluations because okay. they all have to be following the protocol of the building. Um, to Kimberly's point, the vertical circulation um, is definitely something that we've also been talking about a lot. And um, a lot of our clients are curious about, you know, should we use this stair, stair tower is down and this one is up unless, you know, there's an emergency and we're reminding that well, you don't know what the tenant below you is doing, so that really needs to be defined by the landlord. So I think we're we're going to be relying on them more and more to manage that process. And there, I think we we've all gotten used to. I mean, whether you're going back to the gym or whatever, is we've gone from this free flow free flow process to reservation Re reservation less to reservation. Yeah. You guys mo both make good points. Is we we I do know landlords and building owners are struggling with this because they are being looked at as how are you going to manage this and there, there aren't really great solutions for it but you but trying to reserve you know getting on the elevator meaning what's what's the time for that the fitness center um reserving who's going to be using it, what's that look like so um you know what, what type of platforms are they going to use for these types of things even in the workplace too we're seeing a, a surge of interest in um, they've had conference room schedulers for years, but now it's at the workstation level, all right? So you actually know, you know, which, which workstations are open. Um, and I think it's going to be important as people return back because you can see, okay, which one is going to be distanced enough from others and which one is open, green, red, yellow, whatever. So yeah. there are definitely yeah. ways to be able to, to, to do that. And it's interesting what you said, Rob, about... Um you know, controlling it through your device. Our showroom in New York is in a multi-tenanted building on 6th Avenue and the landlord put together this RX well, they're called RXR, the landlord, but they put together this RX well app that you have to log into every day mm -hmm. to give your well, you know, your, the, your status check. And then they have a thermal scan as you walk through the lobby to check, like you said, a heat sensor sort of experience, but it's a thermal scan to check temperatures that way. Um, so it's just really interesting. It's like a new way. I think we have a unique opportunity though to rethink what we think we know and really be innovative about these things. I mean, the tech market is enormously popping because they're so busy creating all these new apps for people, right? So there is sort of an upside and like opportunity. We just have to sort of evaluate where this opportunities are yeah and uh, Nick a question for you real quick and we've been talking here about right uh, thermal sensors and uh, Kimberly was just talking about a, a wellness check that you have to do every day are there concerns around that related to privacy related to HIPAA related to you know I think we you know some people are just not comfortable with those kind of things so are there, are there concerns and, and how are ways that people can address those concerns Certainly. And yes, there are going to be concerns about that. And, you know, and with a lot of the tech companies, you know, they're, they're trying to get solutions out there and, and there could be HIPAA concerns because they, it's just one of those things that might be overlooked. Um, so yeah, there, you know, with biometrics and collecting information, um, you know, it's, it's one of those things where people are going to react differently. Some people are going to see it as, Hey, we're keeping the organization safe or keeping people safe. And then other people are going to look at it as maybe, uh, an invasion of privacy and, and they're going to have, um, some, some issues around that. Um, but really, again, it kind of goes back to what I said, you know, about regulations. If we're clearly communicating why we're implementing these pieces of technology mm -hmm. and, and really helping people understand that this is here to keep people physically safe, it's here to keep people emotionally safe. You know, we want people to feel comfortable when they're, they're in the work environment. You know, we need people to be productive while they're here. And this is the best way to achieve that then. And I think that's going to be the, the best way. Again, communication is, is always going to be key. And then continuing to perform those, those check-ins. You know, managers need to listen to their employees if they're continuing to bring up um, reservations about these different um, tools that are being implemented, then yeah, maybe that's something that needs to be reevaluated and looked at. So I think it's just really trying to keep pulse of your employees and just seeing how they're doing and how they're dealing with these changes emotionally and, you know, helping them understand the reasons why that these things are, are enacted. Thank you. So we are, uh, we're getting close to the end here. Again, if anyone has any other questions, please submit them. Um, we had a, another topic to kind of go into here, but I, I think we should start wrapping it up. So I just want to go around the room, um, everybody take a, a few minutes and just say, uh, provide me or provide us with an overview of where you see the future in general of the workspace being like and the work experience being like. And we'll, we'll, uh, we'll start with uh, right back to Nick. 
Okay, no, that's good. Yeah, and, you know, I, I think for the, the time being, for the foreseeable future, you know, it, we're going to still have a fragmented workplace. You know, as I mentioned, there are a lot of people who and, and organizations are finding out that their employees are, are productive at home um, and, and are going to be able to do a great job. But then there's those folks who who need to be back in the workplace and figuring out how to to balance that that um, fragmentation of, of a workforce and, and still maintain a, a, a culture um, that you've had before. And, and again, it's not going to be the same as it before, but to maintain that positive workplace culture and figuring out those ways. And it is implementing technology so that people can stay communicated so that we can see each other on a daily basis. Um, again, having those, those check-ins with your employees, you know, it, it's really about restructuring our days so that we can not only maximize productivity, but also make decisions quickly and, and move forward in, in a work environment. So, you know, I think that, you know, we still have a lot of uh, unknowns that, that need to be uh, uncovered before we move forward, but we're making progress day by day. And, you know, as long as, again, we keep communicating, we keep uh, checking in on each other, making sure that we're, we're all feeling good and, and that we have the support that we need. And again, you know, I, I will repeat, you know, lean on your employee assistance program. You know, they should be there to help and support you and, and guide your organization through any of the challenges you might be having when it comes to the, the mental uh, health and, and emotional well-being of your folks. So, you know, definitely lean on them because they are a great tool and a great resource. Thank you, Nick. Rob, why don't we jump over to you? Sure. And I know I, I'm probably like a broken record saying this, but um, you know, our, our goal as an organization is to make sure that what we're delivering is going to be a consistent, extraordinary experience for our clients. And um, focusing, if I just focus on the meeting space, because I think that's a, a lot of what we're talking about, um, you know, there, there are always things that are, I mean, it's, it's, it changes so quickly. Um, but the one thing that I think is going to be consistent is that um, people that are using these spaces, especially when they go back, are going to understand that just good enough doesn't cut it. Um, the one thing that's nice I will say about, about the, the younger generation entering the workforce is they're expecting these tools to be there. They don't want to, nobody wants to call IT help desk to launch a video call. It's just, it's unnecessary and it's unreasonable. You know, but it, but we still see it happen. And again, it's because it's just been accepted for so long. So as people go back into the workplace, we're already hearing it. They're going to understand the difference between like we're on a conferencing platform now, like Zoom and Teams. It's a platform. It's not a solution. The, the, the conferencing and a collaborative solution encompasses a lot of other things that uh, I don't think, um, people are really going to be in touch with until they go back and see what it's like sitting in a conference room and bringing on six or seven people from different locations and needing to collaborate on some type of integrated document within teams. They're going to realize this is awful and we really got to rethink it. So, um, and the cool thing is there are a ton of new tools that are going to help make that experience much easier, much more seamless. Um, the space is going to be much more available. So um, we, we still see, and we get challenged by clients based on this is where we need to head. Can you, we need to get it better. You need to get the experience better. It's gotta be easier to use. I wanna walk in a room, just have everything go, you know? So, um, you know, the clients that have been, that have, that have been um, you know, on the, I'll call it a cutting edge or continually pushing that, that's great because the stuff's out there. You can design it that way. You just gotta make sure the client understands that, you know, this is where they wanna head. Lauren? What do you think? Well, I think the future of the workplace potentially um, could be more like an innovation center. Um, I think if we look at innovation centers today as they're designed, um, there's very specific purposes. It's all around sharing ideas, um, brainstorming, coming to a consensus, uh, making decisions. And um, I think that's what the future of the workplace is going to be about. So that could be a good framework um, to help us define how we lay it out. The other thing about innovation centers is there are individual workspaces, but it's not the primary space, the collaboration space is, and also those spaces aren't um, assigned, excuse me, they're, they're shared. And so I think that potentially we could see more of a move toward a fully shared environment where no one has ownership of any specific spaces. Um, and I know that that, you know, maybe 
goes against the grain a little bit of, you know, this idea of dis distancing, but, um, and, you know, we're all trying not to share right now, but there's an old statistic floating around there that I keep hearing unearthed that a, an own desk surface is dirtier than a surface in a restroom comparatively because it's cleaned so infrequently, the, clean, the cleaning crews don't touch it. So arguably a space that's shared where there's a clean desk policy after each use is a much more sanitary environment. Um, so for what it's worth, there's that. Um, and you know, the other thing about, I think, innovation centers is they're not social spaces. And I think that's something that maybe we'll start to reevaluate. Is it okay to come to work to work? Um, and you know, we are social creatures. We will come and we'll talk and we'll, will be productive, but maybe we come to work to work and the spaces are really defined to do that and there are less spaces that are there specifically to socialize or to have such weight of socialization behind their design. Interesting. And Kimberly, we'll, we'll finish off with you. What do you think? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I agree with what Lauren says that spaces are going to be reevaluated, but we need people in place because we're missing that living lab of seeing how people are, you know, observing people in an environment. So at Knoll, we believe that there are three phases of this, the surviving, which we've done up to this point, the arriving that we're planning for and moving people to the next place, and then thriving. So the last one is the future and the excitement and the opportunity. So we believe there's a thriving holistic workplace that's really centered around the individual and the groups. So we are going to kind of rethink what that space uh, really should look like and feel like. And people are the most important part. Uh, getting them in place is great and learning how to collaborate, uh, but we really need to kind of get people back in place. So the future is bright, I'm sure. Wonderful. Well, I appreciate everybody coming on. Thank you to all our panelists, Nick, Rob, Lauren, and Kimberly. We appreciate you being part of this. And, and thank you to everybody that did, attended and um, the one person that submitted a question. Thank you very much. So, <laughs> uh, thank you. And uh, we'll hopefully see everyone again soon. Awesome. Thanks, right. Karen. Thank you, everyone. Right, Have a great day. Be well.